Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Worcester School Committee meeting. And uh, we're going to ask people to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the National Anthem. Hi, Pledge of Allegiance. Here. 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 So we have the approval of the consent decree. Uh, roll call. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, did Ms. Novick get us on that? Yeah, I think her, I think Dr. Frail's mic may not be on. Thank we, you. Uh, can you say it one more time, Tracy? Or the... Um, I think it's possible that Dr. Frail's mic it might 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 not be on. Thank no. you. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay, we're good. Okay. All set. Okay. Okay, we're on. FG recognitions. Okay, we're going to rec we are going to hold the recognition uh, for Nicolette until the next meeting. Roll call. Yes. 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 Yeah, so next item is to recognize the, the many achievements of Louis Ojeda, physical education teacher at Claremont Academy, who was recognized with a citation at the State House during the State of the Latino Education event held on Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. Is Louis here? That's all right. We can, Louis, are you here tonight? We can, we can hold that then uh, to the next meeting. Is that okay? So, is that okay? No. So we'll hold that to the next meeting. Uh, roll call. Yes. Thank you. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay, we have public comment now, and uh, we have a few people who want to speak, I think, from the educators, IAs, and Melissa, you see your name, oh, you have two minutes, your uh, name, and see your, see your okay. residence. Uh, so, Melissa Verdier, my city of residence is Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm also the president of the Educational Association of Worcester. Uh, many of us came out tonight because we are continually in the contract negotiations 
And we have been given a proposal for our paras and we feel like they really deserve their living wage to start now. So we ask that you take that into consideration and that when we come up to have our proposals, which will be the unit AB, that proposal for financials will be in December. And we please ask you to think about the cost of living and how it has increased and how we could really use that support from the school committee on our financials. Thank, Thank you. you. You have a couple more people who want to speak. Buddy. Anybody else? Or? Okay. Get your uh, name and see your residence. Hello, uh, my name is Michaela Quill, and I'm a resident of Clinton, and I'm an English teacher at Worcester Technical High School. Um, I was told there probably wasn't a chance I was going to speak tonight, um, so I have a few ideas floating around if I could just briefly address you. Um, the first thing I want to do is ask you all a question. Uh, if your child came to you, your adult child, and told you that they were working for a company, um, that they really loved, but the companies around them were severely outpacing them in salary. And their company refused to negotiate with them. What would you advise them to do? Uh, the reason I'm here is not to tell stories, although I'm an English teacher, it's to talk about numbers. Teachers aren't supposed to talk about numbers. We're supposed to be maternal or paternal care about our students, give all our free time away, buy all our supplies and everything else. Probably because education has been a predominantly female industry, but we're tired and we don't wanna be treated unfairly anymore. I'm here today because I had been naively thinking that I was pay being paid competitive wages comparable to the surrounding districts. I recently found out that is far from true. A Shrewsbury teacher with my level of education and years of experience is making 15% more than I am. I don't wanna leave Worcester. None of us do. But a lot of the teachers that I've spoken to that have 20 plus years of experience are actively applying right now for jobs out of the city. What are you telling your kids in this city that it's okay that all of these much whiter, more wealthy towns around us are paying their teachers more and they're lo we're losing our veteran teachers to them. And you're like, that's okay. We'll hire a bunch of 22 year old teachers. If you think a 22 year old teacher has the same value as a teacher that's been teaching for 20 years, you have no idea how education works. Most of us don't hit our stride for 10 years. <laughs> One million copies is how many copies of Freedom, Writer, Freedom Writers that was sold. If you're not familiar with the book, it's about a woman who gives 23 hours a day to her students, and it's been romanticized in a Hollywood movie. Well, I have news for you. That woman's marriage fell apart. <laughs> because she was giving her entire life to her students. People love to praise teachers for going above and beyond what's expected. We sacrifice ourselves literally and figuratively, literally in the last 10 years, unfortunately, we sacrifice our lives. But when we ask you to show us that you value us, you turn into the bad date that left your wallet in the car on a date. Suddenly, the money is nowhere to be found. And so I'm just going to ask you with one more question. If your child told you that they were in a relationship with someone that kept telling them that they valued them, but didn't show them that they valued them, would you tell them to stay in that relationship? That's all. Thank you. What's your name, Sia Residence? Hi, my name is Rose Murphy. I was born and raised and educated in Worcester, Massachusetts. I work at Burncoat High School as a paraeducator, and I have been there for seven years. And to be honest, I almost didn't come here tonight because after the days that I've gone through, I am physically and emotionally drained, and all I want to do 
is decompress. But not today. When I started working, I was typically happy heading into school. Sadly, that's no longer the case. I dread my morning alarm before I even go to bed. I do not enjoy coming to work, coming to a workplace where I am treated as a second class citizen. I do not like being talked down to by people who have the same degree as me. Paraeducators are the people who help your children learn and deserve and receive the education that they and their fellow students get. But I have a question for this committee. What do we have to deserve? What do we? It's okay. We got, we got you. What do we have to deserve for all? What do we? What do we? What do we have to do to deserve recognition for all of the hard work that we do? 180 days. What do we have to ask you folks for to get what we deserve? And I think that at the very least, we deserve a living wage. One where we don't have to work multiple jobs. One where we don't have to worry about scrimping and saving to pay our bills, our rent, our groceries, and our medication, we deserve a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, did you name and see your residence? Good evening. My name is Melinda Martin. I'm a resident in the city of Worcester, and I agree with everything that people have said. In the past two weeks, um, I've been punched in the nose. My glasses have been thrown. I, my hair has been pulled by students in my classroom. I love the students I work with. I absolutely love them. But when they are nonverbal and can't express what's wrong and they just come at you, it's difficult to go to work. It's difficult to want to be in the building where you're getting abused on a daily basis because we are so short staffed. I'd like to read a couple of comments that people have people that cannot attend tonight have made, um, it'll be less than the two minutes. Um, we are, our paras deserve that salary. We are so short staffed and some paras have even left the district for smaller districts and better pay. Um, pay our paras a living wage. The people in the offices need to spend a day in the classrooms, in the hallways, on the buses. We all need more money and respect for what we do. Get off your office chairs and get back into the schools. Come and see what we do on a daily basis. The paras in my building are pulling way more than their weight. They are subbing more often than not and making far less than the building subs. And when you pull us para to sub in a different classroom, that means the classroom they're leaving is now short staffed. Inclusion is not happening in many buildings and parents should be aware of this. Inclusion is not happening because if a teacher is out or a para is out in an inclusion room, they can't pull someone from a sub separate room because it's dangerous. Yes, it's dangerous and unsafe to move people so that IEPs are being met on a daily basis. This should be something that should be looked at. This should be, I know Ms. Clancy has brought up not pulling paras. We don't have enough building subs. There, there's no subs and you're going, that has to happen. Paras are being pulled and they're not being put where they need to be because they have to be kept in a room to keep students safe. We need more people in the building and you're not gonna get people at the salary you're offering. You're not gonna get people if you're offering a two and a half percent increase. When I looked at what my pay increase would be, I will be able to buy one additional package of gum every two weeks and I don't chew gum. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Also, okay, thank you. Anybody else wanna speak on any other items? Or? Seeing nobody else, Councilor, we have uh, consideration of City Council George Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. My name is George Russell. I'm uh, 
the District 3 City Councilor and obviously the resident of Worcester. Um, I come to you tonight, uh, uh, a couple of different items uh, that I sent via a communication. I, uh, I'm just here for a couple of reasons. Number one, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the superintendent who uh, took the time on a couple of occasions uh, in this past week to, you know, do some research and to give us, uh, give me at least a, a little bit of an update of where uh, the, the process is on these two items that we have before us. Uh, there are items that I've talked about for a long time on the council floor, sitting in that chair over there during the council meetings. And I just want to make sure that the people of Worcester, specifically the people of District 3, know that we're all on it and that this is a priority for all of us. And I've had personal conversations with the majority of the members of this committee. Mr. Chairman, you and I have talked and visited East Middle School on multiple times. We've talked uh, about uh, the uh, traffic situation at uh, Roosevelt School. These are two items, especially the item of East Middle School where we have plastic sheets hanging from the windows to keep the winter air out, to keep the breeze out. Uh, it's, it's just not right for the kids and the educators that are at East Middle School uh, to have that. Uh, we know it's not an easy task uh, to, to find the funding for that, but I pledge my support as one member of the city council to do everything I can to, to try and make sure that happens. Dan Dunyu, our state representative, I know is working with the administration to try to find uh, to try to uh, get the uh, opera funds from the state of Massachusetts from their opera kitty uh, uh, bucket, if you will, uh, for the East Middle School. I'm hoping that the superintendent and her excellent team uh, can get that uh, program uh, to give us some money for that. As far as the graph, uh, the Grafton Street traffic situation goes at Roosevelt School. Uh, gentleman here sitting next to me is Frank uh, from Batteries Unlimited. He is one of many business owners on Grafton Street that are basically having a public safety problem at two o'clock every day on a school day. When traffic is backed up from Roosevelt School all the way to Slop and Shop, there's a problem. There's a problem for safety for the people that are sitting in those cars. There's a problem for safety of people that are going by. The city council, uh, under your leadership, Mr. Chairman, uh, spent $600,000 for a piece of land. I know your staff uh, here on the school side is working diligently to try and get a plan together to utilize that piece of property for some extra parking spaces. I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, respectfully to the administration and to, to my friends on the school committee, that anything that we could do on a temporary basis to utilize maybe a corner of that lot to get a few extra cars off of the street, even temporarily. I went up to Roosevelt's parking lot this week. As I drove through the parking lot, I saw vehicles parked on the, on islands and parked in all kinds of uh, locations that weren't spaces. I'm suggesting that if we take a little corner of that lot that the city bought and just utilize it in a rough condition with gravel or whatever, maybe we can get some folks to park uh, over there temporarily while we're doing the planning for the long-term use of that lot. But Mr. Chairman, these two items here, I don't come before you uh, lightly. I've sat in that council seat for over 10 years, and this is my first time before the school committee. But these are items that are important. And the people in my district are, are, are saying to me over and over again, they're thinking we're not all on the same page. And I know the efforts of this, this school committee have been working on this, and this superintendent is working on it. And I just want to make sure that they get the message that we're all on the same page. And I welcome you sending it to the joint committee uh, subcommittee okay. of the city council and the school committee. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. you. You want to say, is your name say your residence? My name is Frank Brosha. I live in the city of Worcester. I own Batteries Unlimited, the uh, property adjacent to Roosevelt School. I've been in business for 30 years. And for the past, I don't know, 20 years, that school has been up. Every year, it's got progressively worse and worse, the traffic situation. And Part of it and most of it is the parents don't cooperate with the businesses that they're blocking. They block our entrances, egresses to get in and out. They just stay there. We ask them nicely, can you move? It's just, it just rude. They're just rude to us. They tell us things that I don't even want to get into. And I'm 58 years old. I, I want to go out smiling, not, not like this. I didn't plan on doing this. So 
something has to get done. And today, there was a medical emergency at Roosevelt School, and the ambulances, the fire, the firemen, and the police had a hard time getting to the school and getting into the school because the entrances were blocked. The, the driveways were blocked. So I can go on and on. I have videotape. I have thing. I don't want to bore you with that, but something has to get done. Someone's going to get hurt. It's, it's not a good situation for anybody. It has to get resolved because it's getting progressively worse. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Okay. Everybody else all set down one, one more person. Okay. Is your name and city of residence? Hi, Cynthia C. Cadman-Lanson from Leicester, Mass. I'm, a, I'm an aide to the physically handicapped slash bus driver. Um, we have a problem with students beating up the drivers and monitors. We need a protocol. We call into base when there's a situation and it takes a while to answer. And there's three or four people in that office. It takes a while. Something has got to be done. It's not fair to the drivers and monitors for the pay they get, especially the monitors, to be beat up. And it seems like it's the drivers and the monitors who get into trouble and the students still get to stay in school. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll close that part of the meeting. I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for coming out tonight and uh, well said tonight. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the agenda. We have the report of the superintendent and uh, from here to anywhere, uh, Madam Superintendent. Oh, I'm going to send, we need a roll call to send that to the uh, Committee on Education, Finance, and Operations, the Joint Committee. Uh, sorry about that. Roll call. Yes. 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 Thank you, Council Russell, for being here tonight. Much appreciated. Frank, thank you. Okay. Oh, Madam Superintendent. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So tonight I want to, um, through the chair, take the opportunity to um, share with the community and the school committee and our um, educators in the audience. We're going to update you all on our emergency preparedness actions that we are fine tuning and further augmenting. Um, I want to thank Mr. Allen, Mr. Um, Pazella, Dr. Tatum, Mr. Foley, and Ms. Kelly. Um, you can see that emergency responsiveness is very important to us. We have quite a few people that are going to be speaking to you about that. And so as you know, safety has really two overarching components. It has the physical safety and felt safety. They are not the same, but they certainly complement each other. Tonight, we're going to focus on physical safety and share how we are further aug augmenting practices to enhance both physical and felt safety because, again, they support each other. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen? Uh, to the chair. So as the district is about to embark on a couple of new initiatives, including a comprehensive uh, safety audit of the schools and some new uh, training and E911 platforms, the district thought it was a good opportunity to provide an update to the school committee as we uh, begin those endeavors. So for tonight's presentation, uh, the administration will present to you a strategy for emergency preparedness to keep schools safe, uh, some training procedures and processes for emergency preparedness, and our plan for ongoing communication to families, staff, and students. So we'll start with the perception of safety. From an, from an Education Week Research Center article, we found uh, these, the following statistics, that according to the Ed Week Center National Survey, four out of 10 educators feel less safe than they did five years ago. Six out of 10 are fearful of a mass casualty incident, and that other major areas of concern and anxiety about safety include Fear of dangerous armed intruders, student-on-student -student conflict, interpersonal disputes, and community-related incidents spilling over into the school buildings. 
I'll quickly focus on the, the current context of the Worcester Public Schools with an eye on um, the calls to emergency services in our city from our schools. As you can see, there were 24 total calls made to our emergency could, services. Could I'm everybody, I'm sorry, could you identify yourself for the listening audience? People oh, might not I'm sorry. know you. I'm okay. uh, Dr. Kareem Tatum, Executive Director of Schools um, in the North oh. Quadrant. Okay. Um, so as you can see, there were 24 total calls through, from August 29th through November 3rd of this year. 15 of those calls were to emergency medical services, our ambulances, um, for a variety of reasons, including respiratory needs, seizures, um, incidents on the playground and then dance classes, as well as uh, due to the mental health concerns of, of some of our students. The Worcester Police Department was called on eight different occasions. Um, a few of those were due to off-campus domestic violence issues. Um, there were also confrontations between caregivers on school grounds and investigations of social media threats. And last but not least, we have our Worcester Fire Department who was called once through that time. And I think everyone in the city saw that um, with, with one of our high schools um, being on fire. Good evening, Mayor, members of the school committee, uh, Robert Pozzello, School Safety. Um, currently, as of today, uh, our relationship with the police department, as everybody knows, has been gone going for many years. And uh, as of today, our current model procedures with the Worcester Police are as follows. Whenever there is any type of emergency in a school building, then principals or administrators in that building have to call 911. Relating to non-emergency matters, school principals will call, I have been calling the police department's general complaint line that is also offered to every city resident. And the number is here that you see 508-799-8606. As a result of that call being generated to that line, a response to the school then gets dispatched out to uh, various uh, police officers. Uh, one of them could be uh, the operations division in addition to uh, what we refer to special duty officers. What are special duty officers? Uh, formerly called school liaison officers. Then we have school resource officers. We have briefly gone back to a school liaison officer um, name and now the chief of police as of uh, a month ago has changed the name of school liaison officers to special duty officers. In, reg in regards to uh, other types of support to school principals relating to school safety issues, the superintendent has designated me as a communication liaison on her behalf to, to the police department and the chief of police has designated with the police department, Lieutenant Miguel Lopez to serve as the communication liaison for the Worcester police to our schools. So in terms of our current initiatives, the first one we'll talk about is the strategy for emergency preparedness to keep schools safe. The district has engaged guidepost solutions for comprehensive safety, security, risk, and vulner vulnerability assessment, which will uh, really focus on three key areas. The first one is on on-site physical security review. And just bear with me just so you um, have a sense of the comprehensive nature of the review. So with regards to the on-site uh, physical security review, they'll be looking at things including but not limited to access control, alarms, cameras, locks, the building design, monitoring, uh, physical safety and security applications and standards, uh, safety on school buses, um, visitor management, school arrival and dismissal procedures, and E911 and location tracking. With regards to communications, both internal and external, they'll be focusing on site-based emergency response activities, response capabilities, the deployment and utilization of safety and security personnel, the interaction with safety and security providers and coordination with WISTA police, WISTA fire and emergency communications. And then with regards to policies and procedures, they'll focus on the emergency drills and operation, emergency communications, uh, applications and standards, school arrival and dismissals, the identification badges, evacuation plans, and school uh, safe school plans, uh, safety at sporting events and extracurricular activities, 
school-based training, student safety programs, and an overall effectiveness of existing unarmed security guards at schools. It is expected that this work will commence in the next uh, 30 days or so and will inform the district on school safety related priorities moving forward. So uh, some of uh, our members might have been on the school committee. I know the mayor was in, a few years ago that uh, we had purchased a software program called Enforce 911. And that program uh, was a software to be put on iPhones, smartphones for our principals, administrators, and a, it's a voluntary program, uh, whatever, whatever teachers wanted to participate in this program. So if I can just say this in, in lay person's terms, uh, this is a, a, a phone that we have, each of us have, and um, uh, just to go ahead, that, that co contract was terminated, and very recently we were awarded um, a three-year federal grant, Stop the Violence, and I know this school committee is aware of it because they uh, voted to accept the award of the grant and so as a, re as a result of accepting the grant, the contract, uh, we, we were in negotiations, we, the, the, the bid went out. And as a result of the bid going out, the, low, uh, the bid was uh, just recently awarded to a company called Entrato. And so uh, I think the contract, Mr. Allen might have more information, should be executed and signed within the next few weeks. But the purpose of this, this software program is we all know that unfortunately on some given days that we have a violent intruder, uh, you know, tragically speaking, it could be much worse when we talk about, you know, school safety incidents. So in addition to our current procedures, we have in buildings, making sure our schools are safe, making sure that doors are locked, making sure that everybody's vigilant when they come to school or work on a given day uh, to be aware of their surroundings for intruders. Uh, we wanted to give an extra layer of protection to our administrators, teachers, and most importantly, our students. So this software program will allow, uh, once it's implemented and installed in, in, in the, their phones, it will allow anybody on any given day, if there is an intruder or a violent incident in the building, to directly text 911 uh, the Worcester Police Department. And that is a direct message. As you know, whenever there's an incident in the city, your home, anywhere else, you call 911. This is a direct connect to law enforcement that will take hopefully a, a minute or two off the response time, which will be very helpful. In addition to that type of alert, there are other features, <coughs> excuse me, that can be put in the software program uh, to where, for instance, if there's an evacuation, school safety bosses can go on this iPhone, teachers can pull out. Uh, evacuate the building and have to know where their students' rosters are and to immediately access where they are. And then there is alerts to principals if there's an incident on the west side of the city uh, and uh, whoever has this on their iPhone, if it's a city incident, they will get notification on their iPhone uh, software that be aware of an incident that happened. You might want to be particular, pay particular attention to your school. And then there are many other features that the software program will offer our uh, our staff and administrators uh, to be very vigilant in regards to reacting to safety incidents in the school. So in summary, the emer for emergency preparedness, uh, the district will be having the ongoing assessment and refinement of current protocols with the Worcester Police, conduct a comprehensive school safety and security risk and vulnerability assessment, and then implement and train staff on the new 911 emergency alert system. Moving forward uh, in terms of training procedures and processes and our plan for ongoing communications. Uh, I am also uh, sure some of you are aware of ALICE, Alert, alert Lockdown and Phone Counter Evacuate. A few years ago, we purchased ALICE uh, to where we have provided every staff member in the Worcester Public Schools of an e-learning course that they would take. And as a result of taking this e-learning course, it would give them some basic knowledge on what to do in the event, once again, if an intruder comes into the building and they have to react immediately. And you, the message and the acronym is, is Alice, but you get alerted to the incident. Our teachers and staff could lock down at any given moment. And during the lockdown, if they want to know in real-time information where that intruder is in the building, that's what they call informed. They're informing one another, and that's where our software program 
into place with this with Alice. They'll be able to communicate where that person is that might be causing an incident or harm in the building. Uh, counter is uh, is something that when you come across an intruder, you have to make some quick decisions at times. So we're giving them the skills to possibly know what to do if you do come upon an intruder face to face. And then the most common sense thing that we do with Alice is to train our administrators and our staff members to first option is always to evacuate if you know there is harm in your way and you know you, for safety purposes, for you and your students, you can get out of the building and go to a safe place. So we are providing this course again, starting uh, last month. And so every teacher is required to take, an administrator and other staff are required to take this course. So um, as we all know that we all have to have a emergency plan for our district, like any other district in throughout the, the country and school districts. And we have had uh, emergency response plans for some time now. And uh, one of the things that we recently have focused on is uh, last year, for some time, the, the, the city of Worcester, not just the Worcester Public Schools, was looking for uh, a reunification site. Should we have a large uh, incident in our schools that we would have to possibly manage the incident offsite? Can't go back into the building. So we needed a place to go to where we could be reuni reunited with our students, our families, our administrators, our staff, et cetera. So uh, we, we have an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with Worcester State College. We're in the event that we have to use them for a large scale event. They're, they're, uh, they are available for us to use. Um, the I Love You Guys Foundation, uh, they are a national uh, agency that specializes in uh, standard response protocols, how to train people on, to respond to incidents that require emergency response. And what do you do when you have to re reunificate in certain situations, as I just said? So uh, we had a training uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, it's, it's probably three or four years now. And what we're going to do is that we're going to bring them back uh, in possibly January, sometime around there. And we are going to have a, uh, a comprehensive training with them with our administrators and, uh, and principals in order to have a more effective response to incidents, including once again, if it requires a large scale response from the superintendent and uh, the administration and others. So we will be giving you more information in the future as to how we are progressing with the I love you guys. So with regards to the Alice uh, training, which has been the district's approach specifically for active shooter incidents, however, uh, as just pointed out, this standard response protocol from the I Love You Guys Foundation is based on, uh, on, on a response to any given situation and not individual scenarios. It's the intent that this will become our overarching training and response protocol in the future. However, and most importantly, all of these trainings and protocols live within a much larger environment that we create where students and staff can feel safe uh, in a profound and basic way in our schools. School safety isn't a person and it isn't a department. School safety is the practices, procedures, and resources that we collectively put in place and practice every day to keep students and staff safe, ensure their well-being, and create the conditions for a positive learning environment. Excuse me for not introducing myself previously. My name is William Foley. I'm the uh, executive director of schools for the Burncoat Quadrant. So how do we make people feel safe? What do we do? We plan, we practice, we train, and we support. And how do we do that? We use restorative practices in our coping rooms. We have increased the social emotional awareness throughout our school buildings with increased numbers of, of school adjustment counselors and the addition of wraparound counselors to many of our schools. And we also offer mental health support and through partnerships with community agencies. One of the things that we're very excited about is a pilot program that we're beginning, uh, beginning at two of our secondary schools, North High and Sullivan Middle School. Um, and we're providing those schools with the opportunity to hire school climate and culture specialists. These positions do not require a teacher license or any teaching experience. Um, 
It's really focused on um, ensuring that these individuals assist in the development of a positive school culture, that they ensure the safety of all stakeholders, that they support the enforcement of school rules, regulations, and policies, and most importantly, that they're there to build healthy, good, positive relationships with school communities. So this is something that will we'll hopefully get underway in the very near future and definitely communicate with our building principals to see the impact that this is having on our school communities. Okay. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, and the members of the committee, that gives an overview of some of the training um, uh, in processes that the district is undertaking, um, beginning with the safety and security um, audit, some of the new positions and some of the new training programs that we'll be putting in place. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just want to thank you for the presentation and, uh, and the seriousness of the presentation. Um, besides educating our children, safety is one of the more, I would say our biggest concern, the safety of our children, our administrators and our educators in our buildings and people who are visiting the buildings, whether it be parents or siblings and families. And, uh, I just want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for the, not just presenting this point now, but this is an ongoing. Uh, this is not happened in the last month. The planning has gone on for a number of months. And uh, I did have one question. I think it was on guidepost. Um, you said, Mr. Allen, it would be 30 days of what? 30 days they'll be here? Or when, was, when are they going to have their first report into the school committee? Or to you. To the chair. So the contract through the... RFP process was just finalized yesterday, and I've reached out to them today to begin the kickoff meeting. So they'll hopefully be on site in the city doing their uh, reviews within the next 30 to 45 days with the expectation they'll be complete, toward, hopefully in time for the budget, so we can use that to inform the FY24 budget decisions. Okay. Okay. Questions from anything? Ms. Madam Mail Mailman? Remember, mail man. Remember, there you go. <laughs> um, the mayor's through the chair. The mayor's question about when the report. So we would expect something probably not till springtime, and then that's pretty extensive. Um, it sounded great, like everything we want to know. Can you um, not to go backwards, but can you give us a sense of when the last time that full complete work has been done? To the chair. So we actually um, engaged um, a similar type firm back in 2015, but they only uh, reviewed 15 schools and then gave us a template to complete throughout the rest of the district. And so then we got into COVID and so forth. And so that really process was not complete. And almost immediately um, when the superintendent began, uh, she uh, was asking for a refresh of that. And so through the development of the RFP and the process, we, we've now reached a, um, you know, a contract with Guidepost. So I don't know in my 20, almost 30 years um, that we've done a comprehensive uh, safety audit of all buildings like we'll be doing um, now. Awesome. Thank you. And then on Alice, um, just because I'm new, it, people, everybody's trained yearly. Um, how often does that training happen? It is a three-year course. The initial course is what we're showing this this year, and then a refresher for the second year, as well as a refresher for the third year. All staff from principals, assistant principals, teachers, uh, custodians, cafeteria workers, everybody, every single employee. But do they repeat it every three years, or they do it once? They'll do it. Well, this is the second time we're doing it, so it's a matter of okay. executing another contract in three more years and doing it again with some enhancements. Okay, so potentially they go every. There's a three year cycle, correct. and they go through it multiple times. That's correct. Depending on how, and is there an alternative to Alice out there in the? Uh, the this has been the most uh, received nationally. Uh, I'm sure there's other uh, programs, but I have. No, I'm not aware of any. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Member Clancy. So through the chair, I just have a couple of questions. Um, I know that we made reference to the Ed Week research. Have we ever, and I don't know if this is going to be part of the assessment, but have we ever asked our staff how they're feeling in the buildings? Have we ever done any type of survey or anything? Mr. Allen? So uh, through the chair, 
that's actually a good question. We were just discussing that today. And I think that's something that we do want to fold into, whether it's done by guideposts or we just do it concurrent to okay. that work. Um, it's something that we'd be interested in as well. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. That is something that I'd be interested in. Um, in terms of the emergency calls, are these numbers higher than usual or typical through the chair administration? The 23 that we've, 24 that we've had. Um, Mr. Bazaar. Sure. I can just say right now that the, the superintendent is developing a new tool to, to, you know, analyze calls coming in. So this is just a start. I know that going forward and probably in the very near future, we'll have much more, more accurate data to compare this year to, to previous okay. years. Okay. So yeah. it's not something that we've typically done in the past through the chair. That's correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bazzola. And then one more thing, um, through the chair, to administration, um, you had mentioned that the chief had changed the school liaison officer, just um, just the, the change to the special duty officer. Is that role changed at all, or is there any update on that? Well, I'll, I'll be very cautious what I say because I know the superintendent is engaging in ongoing conversations and meetings with the uh, with the chief of police and the acting city manager. So right now, the, the chief is uh, still talking. Uh, we, there's a school safety task force that has been involved in the ongoing, uh, you know, talks in regards to, you know, future police school relations. But the, the chief recently has changed the name mm -hmm. as of as of a few weeks ago to where the former school resource officers who be, were previously school liaison officers who ended up becoming another school liaison officer title. He has now said uh, until further notice, they will be changed to special duty officers. Okay. Yes. And through the chair administration, is that, is the, is it ch much changed anything with like the SLOs or what well, we were, I'm sorry, what we had been told before, what the, what the role of the SLO was going to sure. be. Through the chair right now until final decisions are made that the principals call the the general number, the 8606 number, and, they, and whoever is responding to a school, whether it's the operations officer, the operations division, or the special duty officer, which has been this, formerly the school resource officers, that's determined by the, 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 uh, the 8606 dispatcher at the police department. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, member Kamara, followed by Member Johnson. Thank you to the chair. I just have one um, question. And that question is, um, I was actually at a safety training also at with, with the Polytechnic Institute. Um, and one thing that I had in mind to ask about this was about, are we now designing like even school buildings to be able to have safety futures rather than um, like programs and stuff? Mr. And Alex. if so, um, is the new Doherty or even South, um, and what are those? In Nelson Place, Mr. Mr. Allen? Through the chair, that's correct. Um, all Nelson Place, South High, and Doherty use the safety consultant as part of its design. And then Guidepost will look at all of the remaining buildings to see if there's any modifications that could be made in those buildings with regards to safety. Okay, thank you. And is there a way that you, perhaps you can give us like a overview in terms of like the schools that have those designs? Like what are what are those designs? Like what um, are the safety designs in the schools? So the chair, generally the biggest um, thing that you'll notice is the way the vestibule is created in the school that will not allow um, visitors to enter the building without going through a double lock system. So uh, the school office can visibly uh, visibly see uh, people coming into the school and then buzz them in um, into the school. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, member, member Johnson. Yes, thank you. Through the chair to the administration, and I'm not sure if this would be to the quadrant managers here, or I'm just wondering, um, this is great overall, the, the overall looking at the safety of our schools and kind of doing a deep, delve into it, but I'm just wondering about the daily safety of the kids and the teachers in a school. What is like, what is the plan of action? I mean, there's been numerous increase of violence in the school fights in the middle schools mm -hmm. and the high school. I'm just wondering where is the administration at now in regards to the overall safety mm -hmm. and concerns mm -hmm. of the students and the teachers in the schools? Sure. Who the mayor? 
Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. For the mayor. So currently, what what, what is happening? You, you, we explained the pro- current protocol that if there's an issue in a school building and it warrants police response, then the principal, you know, it, they will they will consult with their with their with their directors. And I serve in that role too. If does it does it require? If there's a, a fight in the building between two students, does it require a, a, a 911 call? Does it even require a call to the police versus we can solve the problem internally? So that's how the daily conversations go. And then there are some instances where, you know, if they call me as the communications liaison for the superintendent, I will call Lieutenant Lopez and, and I will a- ask him questions about how do you think we should handle this? Because we don't want to get to a point where we're going to have a, a large scale police response. And then the principals as the, as the decision maker in the building will make a decision, whether there's discipline, you know, that will be given to the perpetrator uh, for that matter. If there's a, a few people involved, they'll be all equally held accountable. And then, you know, there's all options for discipline. Thank you. Through the chair, again, and that's good, but I'm actually not looking for um, any police intervention and police yep. call to the school. I'm actually looking and I'm wondering if this maybe would be for Dr. Tatum, Mr. Um, Foley and Kelly. Um, I'm talking about the overall safety of the kids in school. I mean, there's an ongoing issue in schools in regards to increased violence and things in school. So I'm just wondering, school assemblies, teaching points, talking points, different things that we may be or you're thinking about starting to do now with the increase in school, with the violence between the students? Mr. Foley. Through the chair. Uh, So I think that speaks to the increased use of school adjustment councils and wraparound coordinators or sort of justice practices. Um, Schools, when they can, take proactive action. Um, Unfortunately, we don't always have the opportunity to take proactive action. At that point, we take restorative action. But um, whenever possible, uh, schools are really good about taking proactive action and heading off a lot of problems before they take place. Thank you. And I have another question. This is in regards to the the, the um, finance and operations meeting that had occurred last night. And I just had a question around security offices in school. So I'm just when I talk about the the the, the safety of kids and um, the teachers in school um, and um, Mr. Bazala, you had talked last night about increasing two security offices in a couple of schools due to some concerns or whatever. I'm just wondering, how does that occur? And I'm just wondering with the increase with um, the incidents in school, when are those conversations happen on whether or not we should look into that? Now, again, I'm I'm gonna say, I don't think that's the end all be all, but when we're just talking about doing something or putting something in place until we have a MOU or different things in place to, to work with this, when does that become a priority to kind of look, take a look at these situations? Well, as I said last night at the finance committee meeting, and I know school committee member, um, Novick O'Connell's on, she was asking the question. She wanted a report. The uh, w- We have had security guards, to see a little history in our schools going back to 1999. And the, the last couple of years, we have increased them in, in a couple of our schools, uh, one being uh, Claremont and the other one being Chandler Elementary School. So when, when principals, uh, they reach out to their, to their directors and, and they, they're always communicating with them as far as increase, you know, uh, illegal activity or delinquent activity around their building. And, you know, this is with the, the support of police, police responding occasionally. But it's, it was to a point with these two schools that they felt that having an unarmed security officer in their building would, would, would calm a lot of a lot of a lot of the things we, we don't talk about publicly is that, you know, we have perpetrators, but we have victims and we we get calls a lot. We get concerns a lot from parents. I know school members here from parents, but we get we get a lot of calls that, you know, uh, parents, as we're talking about school safety the last few months, you know, being a major issue. But we get calls a lot. And so we get usually calls from the outside parents. Vendors. And then we get calls internally and concerns from principals and administrators in the building, including teachers. So the two, last two schools that we added security guard, there was a lot of activity that was causing safety in each of those schools. So 
I did confer with Mr. Allen. Uh, we, we, we processed it. And uh, we did add two new positions to those schools. I don't know if I answered your question fully. Yes. Um, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. McCullough. And, uh... Thank you. And I just want to thank all of you for the report. I know that there's a great deal of work going on around school safety, both the overall everyday safety, but then the overarching safety plans. And I just, I want to start off by thanking all of our administrators, educators, teachers for what they do each and every day in our buildings to keep our students stay safe. Because I think we do know that as we've faced some additional, you know, some mental health challenges, some social emotional challenges, we have seen um, a little bit more prevalence maybe with some of the incidents at school, but our educators are working so hard to keep our schools generally very safe. But this is so important that we're doing this proactive work right now that all of you are talking about in order to make sure that we're enhancing that safety and maintaining the safety. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of those uh, pilot programs that we're doing. I know that you touched on them as part of the presentation, but I think those are important, I think, for the community to know even a little bit more about if, if it's possible for you to speak on that now, just talking about the culture. Um, I'm, I'm, the name of the exact title is escaping me at this moment, but I think um, Dr. Tatum or Mr. Foley, if you could speak on those at all, I'm not sure if you feel comfortable at that point. If not, we can do it at a later time. I just think it's important, I think, for people to understand what those roles are a bit. Thank you. Through, through the chair. chair. As I said, it's a it's a pilot program. It it has not gone gotten underway yet. Um, and speaking to both the principals at Sullivan Middle School and North High School, they have started the interview process and are looking for um, potential candidates to fill that role. Um, but in terms of giving you feedback as to how it's going, I, we don't have that information at this time. I apologize. I didn't mean how it's going. I know that they're, they haven't started yet. I just think it's something that's unique that we haven't really done before. So I don't know if the superintendent would want to comment on that a little bit through the chair. I'm not sure. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Yes, through the chair. So um, the model is based off of, actually, I've learned um, Boston has something now in place similar to this, but it's actually based off of um, what I experienced uh, working in California. And so the title of the positions are slightly different, but the idea is um, these school climate and culture, I think we actually call them assistants. I think that's what the job description said that you approved don't hold me completely to that, but what their jobs will do um, will be to build that positive relationship with students in the schools, very much what you were talking about, um, Member Johnson, um, make sure that they, they're not assigned to a class or they don't have a roster, right? So they will be in the hallways when students are walking through the hallways, they'll be in the lunch area when there's break, they can go in and out of um wherever students would be during the school day, um, building relationships, getting to know students, helping to know what's going on amongst the student body so that if there are some challenges that are happening between certain students, they can get ahead of that and squash that before it becomes um, a, a conflict of some sort. And on those occasions when then a conflict does happen and there is a fight, these individuals will be trained on how to break those fights up um, so that the students don't get hurt, so that they don't get hurt, and so that our classroom educators also are not having to go and break up fights. Um, it's not ideal. Um, fights happen very quickly. I've been on campuses where it can happen within seconds, literally nanoseconds, um, where it's calm and then it's there's a there's a fight and all of a sudden there's 50 students around each other watching, right? So it does happen very quickly. Um, these individuals are very quick and responsive to be able to do that. Uh, we will make sure that they are trained not only in um, CPI strategies so that, again, they don't get hurt, they don't hurt um, other children, but also that they're trained on how to um, build positive relationships with students. So I've been speaking with Dr. Tatum. He's already got people set up with our social emotional learning um, 
office to put that training in place as soon as these people get hired. And then the dean of students that you also approve to be placed at North, that individual will work very closely with the Office of Social Emotional Learning. Um, once we get our administrative director for positive youth development that you've also approved, and we're getting ready to interview those people, this will all funnel through all of that. Training will take place for everybody. Um, that so that we're setting the individuals up for success who will be working at our schools, both at North and at Sullivan, but then we can analyze at the end of the year. So that's the plan. These um, these three people that are being approved for, or three positions for North, two for Sullivan, we will train them, we'll make sure they have the tools and the resources, we'll put them in the schools, we'll work with them on a regular basis so that they're supported. Um, and and very much it's a proactive approach to school climate and culture, um, but also being ready to respond when um, incidents happen on the school campus. Thank you. I appreciate Dr. Tatum and Dr. Monarez both answering my question there. Thank you. Okay. Is it Kendra? Hi. Can you introduce yourself? And uh... Um, I'm Kendra, um, ex officio, and I'm from Worcester Technical High School. So my question is specifically to the school climate portion of the report. So I just want to know, how are we adequately, like, instilling preventative measures to violence? Because when you think about it in retrospect, most of these students that are being violent and getting into fights pretty much have nothing to lose at this point. Um, so, you know, stuff like calling police or reporting them, it's not necessarily working. Violence incidents in Worcester Public Schools are only increasing. So I'd only assume that if one route isn't working, we take another. How are we not only just informing our staff or our faculty of training on how to deal with violence, but training our students, the actual perpetrators, because um, not to justify violence within students, but students act out, act out of character. It should not be culture of Worcester public school students to resort to fighting. I shouldn't have to go to school and I could get in a disagreement with my peer and fear that my peer is going to throw a punch at me. So what are we doing to not only train faculty, but to train students on why violence is not the answer? Because many students are picking up on that culture that just continues to spread because in reality, reporting students is not really working in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I got a response, Madam, Super Madam Superintendent. Kendra, every time you say something, you are just, um, you're so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspirational. I just want to tell you that first and foremost. So can, so I know I've asked the team to um, work on a student leadership model that will go down into our schools. Can we give any kind of update on what that's going to look like? So we've got the, st the superintendent student advisory, um, but then we're supposed we're working on getting a, mo a model in place that will, and we're not going to look at just, the model is not about reducing violence. The model is about building leadership, just, just to kind of flip it a little bit, right? But if, if Miss um, Kelly could speak to yep. this a little bit. For those of you that don't know me, Alan Kelly, I'm Executive Director of Doherty. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about our student advisory councils because the information we got at Burncoat was immense. A lot of the ideas of things that we're bringing to schools and that we plan to bring to the teacher advisory council were from our own students. Um, we already a lot asked for extra support, mental health support from outside agencies, and that was something we were always already working on. In terms of what's happening at schools, we've asked all principals to have some sort of a student voice forum where they meet with students and all different types of students, just like we did with the Student Advisory Council. We had at least four to six students from every single high school so we could hear 
all different voices. Um, so we've asked for um, student forums to meet, to hear their perspective, to hear what's going on. Also at the elementary level, we were expecting that too. And we're in terms of like student councils or just student groups. Um, we also, I don't know if we've talked a lot about the coping rooms that we're trying to put in. So we are, I think it's almost every secondary school we're trying, we're, implementing something called the coping room where trained people will be in on curriculum, such as how to avoid conflict or um, different or in the restorative practices. If there is a tussle or a fight out in the hallways, they will go to these coping rooms and try to work out and come up with better solutions and they'll be housed by trained, trained people. So that is coming. Some, I think there's, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think there's a coping room in some schools already. Okay. okay. And, and if I can just add, sure. I know uh, Kendra spoke about um, students that are acting out in these ways, having nothing to lose. Um, and, and I disagree because our students have a lot to lose um, in acting this way. So it's about educating our students, uh, making sure that they're heard, they're listened to, they're supported, um, and, and continuing the educational process. Because if we do not take that route, um, we're, we're looking at students that are going to have very difficult futures ahead of them. Um, so it's, it's something that we take very seriously, um, that we'll be very attentive to, um, but it's, it's something that's definitely have to, that has to change in, in the near future. Okay. Um, Ms. Novick, Madam, Ms. Novick, remember Novick? You spoke over, you get to him. I did not speak already. Mr. No, I'm not speaking to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I first just want to say that I appreciate the, the way in which this conversation is being framed, um, because I think that there has, not just in Worcester, but in, in many places, there is a tendency to limit school safety to this notion of, um, you know, the threat of active shooters and police response. Um, and, you know, certainly, you know, we know that there actually has been an increase of, of that and, um, since that grabs the headlines and unfortunately continues to be something that the country has not responded to effectively the way that it needs to nationally. Um, I understand why, but I appreciate the fact that the Worcester Public Schools, um, first of all, just brought this home to us in noting that when it comes to actual emergency response, um, predominantly what we actually see are medical responses. Um, and honestly, for the, the fact that we have what, 30,000 people gathered on an annual basis, two months of emergency calls that we, in which 24 were made, um, 15 of which effectively were in a medical emergency. Um, it's not really that surprising. And so I, I first think that that's a really important reflection um, of something that not just we, but the community needs to be really clear about, which is that when it comes to us actually needing to respond to emergencies, most of the time what we're talking about are responding to the kinds of things that you would naturally expect to see happen when you have 30,000 people gathered on a daily basis. Um, I also wanna be cautious because I, I've heard a couple of times it said, um, we're seeing an increase, we're seeing an increase. Um, we don't, we're talking without data. So I, I wanna make sure that we as a committee and we as, I also think I heard it from at least one of the administrators, um, it, we, I don't know that we are seeing an increase. And before I get a flood of, you know, comments from individual teachers saying that they're seeing X, Y, and Z, let's remember that anecdotes aren't data. So uh, I want to just caution us not to sort of talk off our head on that, because I think that that leads into, and again, I appreciate the way administration framed this, um, the notion of perception. And we know that perception can influence how we think things are. Um, it, it does, but that doesn't actually mean that is the actual sort of functional reality. Um, and we need to respond to that. I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, first of all, through the chair to what I think is probably Mr. Allen, in terms of the guidepost review, you mentioned in passing policy, and I actually did wonder that. Um, we do have a couple of policies that have to do with um, emergency response and um, so forth in the buildings. Is that actually going to be part of their review as well? Mr. Allen, through the chair, yes. Okay, um, great. So then we'll, we'll look for 
my, my final question is going to be what you need from school committee. So obviously that will be part of that. Thank you. And then in terms of um, some of this information we're getting here regarding um, both the police response and 911, um, I, I want to follow up on what member Clancy was asking about this notion of a, a shift again of title. Uh, my understanding was that the safety liaison officer was something that was actually recommended from the school safety task force. Um, can I can I ask for reasoning if we know it as to why that then was changed through the chair to administration? Through the mayor, um, the the title was very recently changed by the by the chief of police. And uh, he feels that that title of his former school resource officers. And once again, we had school liaison officer titles prior to the officers going into the schools back in 2014. So he felt that, that would be the um, a better title for each of his former SROs. <clears throat> That's where it stands right now. Excuse me. But once again, as I said earlier, the superintendent is in, in, in ongoing meetings with the acting city manager, the chief of police, the task force recommended because they were basically not not so much educated on, you know, titles versus responsibilities. Their main concern was what is going to be the responsibility of the police officers once they were physically taken out of the high schools. So I, I they weren't I don't believe they were too caught up in the title versus the responsibilities going forward. Um, I, of course, didn't serve on the school safety task force, but I, I think that I might differ with that. The school lia the, um, the safety liaison model is actually sort of a national model, um, and I, I'm sh I pr believe that probably was chosen quite deliberately. Um, in any case, the, this notion of the, um, the 911 emergency alert system, um, first of all, I appreciate that, that the follow-up that this was actually part of the stop grant. Um, I'm, I'm failing to understand what it actually does because my understanding as sort of an average citizen is that there is effectively nothing faster than one can do than to call 911. Am I being told that if you purchase a program, you can somehow bump yourself ahead of in line when you call 911 through the chair to administration? Through the chair, it is obviously a priority call. I mean, and it is not up to us, but it's up to the dispatch uh, to determine the, the 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 response. What what would be given priority? Uh, as you know, the 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 reason why we purchased this in the beginning was because of a violent intruder. But this the the vendor we hired in Trotto, There's many more features that could be beneficial to the school district, not just in response to a to a a, a violent intruder. So my answer is that. Yes, it goes directly to law enforcement and dispatch. It, it does get prioritized, but the response could be very, much faster than if they just, when, when, you're, when you're in a school building and you're deciding, I, this is an emergency. I have to, I have to get this to the, to, to, the, to the principal. That takes a couple of minutes. But we are now empowering people who have this on their software to now you can make the call to dispatch on your own. So that's why there's a there's a there's a uh, a response time can be much faster. Once again, traditionally you're in a school, you're a teacher, you see you see you see somebody in the building, they might have a weapon. So what you do normally is that you report it to the assistant principal, it goes to the principal, the principal says, "I want to call 911." Well, that could be a minute or two. With this software program, you can right away make a decision. We entrust you to make a a, a wise decision immediately that I either have to call 911 or it doesn't have to be, or I can dispatch it with my phone versus the, um, the software program, or I'm going to reserve it to where I'm just going to notify the administration and we can handle it internally. Okay, wait, I'm sorry. We don't, so we, first of all, we don't need a software program to call 911, just to be clear, right? Every, every, every person who is currently in a school building that has a cell phone can call 911. If I'm understanding correctly, I now actually have two questions. If I'm understanding correctly, effectively, just what this does is put you in charge with in touch with dispatch. That's also what calling nine one one does. So there there isn't any change there. I hope, and I'm not sure who this question should actually go to, that we don't need a software program in order to tell, frankly, anyone in a building 
that if they see something that requires immediate emergency response. And by the way, I just I want I do want to correct the record here. We we didn't actually get this grant as a result of a violent intruder. We have not had a violent intruder in the Western public schools. Um, but the the notion that someone needs permission to call 911 under such circumstances, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't think that actually is even currently the case. Is that the case through the chair to administration? Senator Chair, first of all, in response to your questions, this program would be very valuable to us. Yes, we haven't had a horrific incident in the Worcester Public Schools going way back to probably 1988. Uh, but this not only often gives the, the respective staff member the call directly text dispatch 911, the real time information. I, I have researched and studied school safety shootings since Columbine in 1999 when I was hired in 1997. When there is somebody in the building that's causing harm, if you have if you're locked down in your in your classroom, you have very little information to act on and respond. So this software program will allow you to be able to communicate with others in the building, real-time information sharing that would allow you to make a wise decision. Should I stay locked down in my, in my classroom with my students that I'm entrusted to care for, or should maybe I evacuate, which is part of the ALICE training, making wise decisions, fast decisions based on a school safety threat in your building that could harm you and others. So this software program is very valuable, I believe, for us to have in the Worcester Public Schools. Yes, people can call 911. I, 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 we have two former principals, actually three right here, sitting. They can tell you that if, they, if, if someone in their building sees a, an incident happening that requires a 911 call, I, I won't speak for the former principals, but I'm sure they will call 911 and they will not be uh, punished for it. Okay, so I just I think it's very important for us to make sure that we have a, a clear record here because obviously this is you know a public meeting communicating to both our staff and our students and our families that if someone sees something in a building, um, and certainly I understand that we always think of worst case scenarios, but there's certainly, as was amply noted by administration already, most circumstances requiring an emergency response are not in fact anything of the kind, they're medical. Um, that doesn't require either per permission or a software program. The software program is not actually going to put them in touch with dispatch any faster than calling 911 does. Um, just wanna make sure that we're clear on both of those. And in terms of um, the, the process here, uh, so we've just signed a contract for this now. The, um, I, I assume through the shared administration that this alongside Alice training um, is going to be part of also part of the security audit through the chair to administration. Mr. Allen. Through the chair, yes. Thank you. Um, and then do we have an idea? It, it sounds as if we have a contract with Alice. When will that contract be up? Does anyone know offhand through the chair to administration? We just uh, executed a three-year contract with Alice. So it will uh, be terminated in the year 2025. And that, that is also through the chair administration being evaluated as well as part of the security protocols. Mr. Allen. So the chair, they'll be evaluating everything that we do in the district to include trainings. Thank you. And just one more thing, Mr. Chair. I, um, I do want to note, and I appreciate, by the way, the superintendent sending out the backup information for the I Love You Guys Foundation. Um, I do want to recommend, in particular, to our staff taking a look at it. Um, because I know that there's been a significant amount of concern about the amount of trauma that we put staff through um, because of the kind of training that we unfortunately have done in the past. Um, one thing that particularly struck me, again, was this, this sort of all-encompassing notion of we really have to get past this notion that the only thing we ever are responding to is active shooter, because first of all, mercifully, that remains extraordinarily rare. However, there are lots of other things that we do actually need to respond to. Um, that we should actually be ready to and actually physically train for. Um, in particular, something that I as a parent found um, particularly um, really reassuring, and honestly, as a former educator, was the one requirement that I love you guys has of districts that enroll in it um, is the following. 
The protocol, and I'm going to read this to you. The protocol also carries an obligation. Kids and teens are smart. An implicit part of the SRP is that authorities and school personnel tell students what's going on. Certainly temperate at the elementary school level, but middle schoolers and older need accurate information for the greatest survivability and to minimize panic and assist recovery. Um, and when I think about how often we effectively kind of play games with the notion of school safety um, and how often we are not actually thoughtful and updated, um, that and also, by the way, the, rec the notion that um, students are going to get on their uh, on their phones and text their parents when something happens and that that shouldn't be prevented. Um, speaking as someone whose first response a couple of weeks ago was to text my kid who was at burn coat, absolutely dead on in terms of how what human nature is. And also a real recognition of what safety actually means, because to me, that actually brings home again the idea, um, as was mentioned here in terms of what we're doing is we're creating a no, not just a physical safety, um, but this notion of felt safety, right? Which is that if, if this is really all about creating a learning environment, it's all about how we actually feel, not just how we actually are. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate the, the way in which um, that is being attended to um, in terms of the work of the administration right now. Um, and I say that again, not only as a member of the school committee, as a former educator, but as a parent, um, because I do think, again, I think we should stress that, you know, there really is no greater um, trust and expression of confidence that several of us can be giving you, which is th then the fact that there's several of us here that are actually literally putting kids on buses every morning. So, you know, I, I have con great confidence in the safety that we have in the schools. Um, but more than that, I have great confidence in the perspective that administration is actually bringing to the creation of school safety. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Member Mailman. Um, thank you. I'm going to let one question go in sense of time. But the second question is actually to the chair through the superintendent. Um, with the change in SLO, SRO, SPDs, is that what the next one is, whatever it's going to be? Um, where is our MOU? And we had talked at our last meeting about... Um, a policy that we would create potential, you would create and send a governance or something. It seems we probably need to move on that. Madam Superintendent. Through the chair. Um, we, so in response to the first question, where are we with the MOU? We're still in process. We met um, as a safety task force Tuesday of this week, I believe. We had um, Leon Smith, the executive director from um, Center for Juvenile Justice come and just help reframe again for everybody. This is what we can do. This is what we cannot do in terms of the model um, SRO MOU. So we, we got clarity on that. We can add to the model um, MOU. We cannot delete from it. Um, there are still conversations with our chief of police, myself, the acting city manager, as Mr. Pazella spoke about in terms of, so then what are we going to do with the, the MOU? Um, given the fact that we are now in November without an MOU in place, we very much as a school district need something in writing uh, so that our staff knows when and um, when to engage with our city police, um, what are the appropriate channels that we just need clarity. Um, it, again, it goes to that idea of felt safety. You need to know what to do that, that in the case of any situation. So um, I do believe we need to do that as a district while we still work on finalizing this MOU. They do not need to be separate and we do not need to wait for one before the other. It's going to so be on we, next week's agenda too. Huh? Will be on next week's agenda. And there is, um, a, there's already something that um, a committee member has requested to go on. But we next. also talked about it at our. We, I'm sorry, we talked about it at our last meeting, and mm -hmm. I thought that we talked about having a policy created within the system. Correct. So okay. that's where we need to go, and there is. So we're going to have two policies. We're going to have a school policy and a SPD policy. No, formally an SRO, SLO. The um, the school policy will let us know right now what we need to do for the remainder of this school year. I'm not, I'm, 
I'm not comfortable us continuing as a district without something in writing. So because we don't have this MOU and we have to work with our police department on that, in the meantime, I'd like for us to have something as a district. Um, what we do know is what is in um, the law and what we um, will be part of the MOU. So I'm anticipating that that's what we can bring forward to our, um, our governing council, our standing governance to take a look at. And so they will complement each other. They will not um, be separate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council. Council. Member Kamara. Thank you um, to the chair and um, to the administration. I have two questions. One is about um, the um, the question that we got earlier um, with regards to just fights in schools and the um, the schools, uh, the school climate job position, and then also the school dean. Um, there was some question about, or there is a question about. Um, these roles, because when I think about, when I, at least when I read about this job descriptions, it was more about prevention, right? Like how are we preventing things? Um, and it almost assumes that a person in such a role, like a school climate, um, once we have that person, would be one that would know students in the school, like know them, because it's, they're in the specific school. Um, and for such that perhaps ha having built relationships with students, having knowing students um, and understanding um, where fights come or how they come about, even gathering some data and facts from students who know what's going on in the school as well, will be able to um, prevent fights. Is that how we're thinking about this at all? I'm superintendent. Through the chair, that's the ideal, that they are, yes, people in the community, people that possibly live in the neighborhood, um, that the students have, they see them either as an older brother, older sister, or a mother figure, father figure, people like that. Yes, so absolutely people in the community and very much um, preventative. That's that's the ideal, that, that we do preventative. At the same time, want to give them the tools so that if there are situations where they need to intervene because something took place that they also can do that. So very much about the positive school climate first and foremost, mm -hmm. and then also the tools to intervene when they need to. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my other question is just um, about like uh, member Millman's um, comment and as we're hearing <laughs> that now the SLOs, the name is now being changed to what is a special duty officer. So my question is, um, is that, is, are we still going to be looking at whatever state policy for that? Because the conversation was around the SLOs and using it, the what the state has and marrying that um, to similar language. So if we're changing a name, is there another procedure or are we going to keep within that room? And what is actually going on here? Well, Through the chair. Yeah. So the change of name by the chief of police was not something I was necessarily aware of. However, it does not change the fact that if we enter into, as I understand what the, the law says um, and or what the model SRO pro, um, MOU is about, regardless of what we call the position, whether we call it an SRO, we call it an SLO, or we call it a, I don't know what the other, the new one was. It, it doesn't matter. If there is a formalized agreement between the city police and a school district in the state of Massachusetts, we are required to use the model SRO MOU. So regardless of what it's called, it's also, and this was made very clear to us multiple times, it doesn't matter where the officer is located. So we can say they are located in a quadrant. We can say that they're, they are not going to be located at our schools, or we can say they're going to be at our school. It is still the same MOU that we are required to, required to use. That's our understanding. Um, and the MOU must have the specific components, which are outlined, outlined in the law. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And just uh, want to thank the team for coming out. And I just have one quick question on guideposts. They have a pretty good reputation nationally, Mr. Allen. Is that correct? 
So the chair, uh, yes, I, I didn't bring their materials with me, but they actually are a national firm. They have a Boston office and they've done a number of large school districts. Okay. So I'm looking forward to their analysis. And this is, I wish this is probably one of the most important issues that we face nationally, statewide in the city of Worcester is making sure our children are safe in the schools and the teachers and administrators. And, uh, with this team in place, I, um, we we're in the right direction. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Bill Turner. So we're going to, um, the superintendent's report, the motion is accepting the file roll call. Yes. 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 Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. So next is reports to the standing committee, uh, which is the first one is teaching, learning, and student supports. Met on Thursday, Tuesday, October 18th on the Durkin building. Member McCullough. Thank you. Yes. So at our teaching, learning, and student support meeting on October 18th, uh, present were myself, uh, Vice Chair Mailman, Member Kamara, Dr. Morris, Dr. Sippel, Mr. Foley, Mr. Tatum, Dr. Friel. We also had Mary Mead Montague, Angela Plant, Vicki Roman, and several others in attendance with us as well. The first item was CNP 0-2 to consider a communication from Gordon T. Davis, Chair of the Education Committee, Worcester Branch, NAACP, relative to a uniform district-wide policy on age-appropriate touching. We had been waiting for some guidance on this, and Dr. Morse presented the guidelines for administrators that were recommended in consultation with Attorney Tobin. On a roll call of 3-0, to zero, the item was filed. GB 1-53 requests that the administration collaborate with community agencies, retired teachers, and other groups to study the feasibility of establishing a summer learning program to assist K-8 through students. On a roll call of 3-0, to zero, the item was filed. Item GB 1-323 requests that the administration provide an update on the use of Fontas and Pinnell literacy program in light of recent data. This has come up several times over the past few years. We had some great conversation in committee. Dr. Moore stated that in June, the administration conducted a survey with elementary school principals and teachers to assess and get their input into how they thought the program was working, which is something that we had been asking for. We wanted input from our educators who are actually using it. And most schools reported that they found the program somewhat to not effective at all. And then they felt that the phonics component failed to meet the standards that they had for the program and really just felt that we needed to be doing something different and Dr. Morris let us know that administration, along with principals, teachers, and the community will begin actively pursuing adopting a new curriculum, which they have already begun to do. So on a roll call of three to zero, the item was filed. Mm -hmm. Item GB2-94 requests that the administration provide an update on the Worcester Public Schools opt-in and opt-out options regarding the sex education curriculum and provide the full scope of program per grade level and information regarding the hiring of staff. Um, the information was shared that they are creating a form to capture feedback from students and caregivers, and we'll be sharing it um, with us. I asked if there was training that had occurred for the new hires, and we were informed that trainings were held and new hires were trained in the curriculum. <clears throat> and as far as getting our families and caregivers and parents to have a better understanding of the actual health curriculum and what is actually in the program that is taught in the Worcester Public Schools, we made available lessons at the Know Your School Nights, and that um, you know, questions were able to be answered by families and caregivers on those nights. Member Mailman made the following motions, request that the administration provide a report in November on the number of sex ed curriculum instructions, instructors by grade and request that the administration consider holding information sessions for caregivers in the spring in preparation for next year and provide an update in February. On a roll call of three to zero, the motions were approved and then the item was held for an update at the end of the year. So that motion um, carried and the item was held. GB2-145 requested the administration provide a report from January to present regarding teacher shortages to include teacher absences by school and indicate the resources utilized to cover the classroom. 
Dr. Moore stated that instructional staff worked very hard to cover absences and ensure that classes were covered. There are still a high number of teacher shortages in ESL and special ed. Member Kamara asked if there was any data on students sparing in classes um, and teacher absences dependent on the subject topic. <laughs> I'll stop talking if you really want me to. And, um, <laughs> and Dr. Morris um, <laughs> let us know that there is definitely a correlation between absences and achievement. And certainly since uh, post COVID, we have seen fewer absences across the board, but um, if we needed to file a new item regarding data, that would be done. On a roll call of three to zero, the item was filed. GB 2-186 requests that the administration allow the Worcester Bravehearts to discuss the organization's school-based opportunities that link students to reading. Dr. Moore stated that Ellen Kelly was setting up a meeting and that those opportunities will be brought forth to the students in the Wor Worcester Public Schools. On a roll call of three to zero, the item was filed. GB 2-218 to accept the early college full school expansion year two fund code 175 grant from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Continuation administered by the Office of Early College in the amount of $500,000. We have approved this grant as a committee. We had multiple post-approval questions in committee, including conversations around how the pro program would be evolving moving forward, discussing transportation opportunities for students to ensure that students have access to the programs. Member Mailman stated that she believes that colleges are not getting the proper amount of reimbursement and that we need to advocate more on the state level and that we really need to be looking at this more and how this is going to be moving forward. Will this be priority of current, I mean, excuse me, now future state administrations to have an emphasis on the early college programs? And member mailman requested the administration provide a report on other districts that are implementing the early college program to include um, how they compare to the Worcester Public Schools. Member Kamara requested information on how the district is supporting guidance counselors to include the methods and strategies that are being used to support students in a career path. On a roll call of three to zero, the item was held for updates in December and then on a roll call of three to zero, the meeting was adjourned at 6.50 PM. Okay, we're all set. Roll call for approval. Member Clancy. Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Member Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just one question. When we had initially approved um, the sex ed um, curriculum, I believe that part of the initial conversation was that we would be talking about whether or not there was going to be a need. I, I see the the conversation happening here about sort of staffing and and particularly elementary school, um, but whether or not we were going to need um, effectively expansion, um, whether we were covering everything that we, we were going to need to be and that there may in fact be a budgetary in, um, interaction there. Can I just ask, and I, I appreciate um, member McCullough's minutes here, um, it, through the chair administration, is is that part of the conversation that's happening as well as to whether or not we have the amount of time and staff um, allotted that's appropriate? No, through the chair fine. to member Novick, that actually was part of the conversation as okay. well. And uh, Dr. Morse gave us some insight as far as, you know, ensuring that we're working more with the schools around scheduling so that we're doing that appropriately to make sure that those classes are being offered correctly and that administration is going to continue to work on that and will also be letting us know in the near future if additional staffing is needed for those courses so that we can work with the budget needs in preparation for the next school year. So I do appreciate that question. Um, it was a conversation that happened. It wasn't quite as in-depth for part of our notes, but that did come up and Dr. Morse was able to provide us some of that information. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you, roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member Okonanovic? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes, Standing Committee on Governance and Employee Issues, on Tuesday, October 25th. Member Clancy? Thank you. Um, so through the chair, the standing committee met um, at 503 on October 25th. Present was Member Johnson, Vice Chair McCullough, and myself. Representing administration was Dr. Monarez, Dr. Morris, Ms. Boulay, and Dr. Frail. The first item we took up was CMP 2-8, which was to consider a petition from the PTO at Chandler Magnet to convert the school to a completely bilingual program. Um, 
we had numerous parents um, there to speak on the item in favor of converting Chandler Magnet to a fully bilingual school. Vice Chair McCullough made the following motion to request that the item be sent to a standing committee on teaching and learning and student supports for further discussion. On a roll call three to zero, that motion was approved. The next item we took up was GB2-1. 144, which was to request the administration to provide the rules from Human Resource Department regarding quarry background checks for school-based volunteers, including PTOs. Ms. Boulay did state that the district policy um, regarding quarry checks and that the state has regulations regarding quarry checks as well, um, and that all volunteers, employees, and contract contractors who are actually in not in direct contact with children um, required um, to undergo background checks. Um, I had asked that the schools, it, that the schools were made aware of the policies and regulations. Ms. Boulay stated that all schools have that information, but that she would be resending it out to all the schools. On a roll call of three to zero, that item was filed. Next, we took up CMP 2-11 was to consider a communication from the EAW of approval of sick donated times. Um, that was an old request for May 3rd. So on a roll call of three to zero, that item was filed. Next item was CMP 2-14, which was to consider a communication from the EAW regarding approval for donation of sick days for two educators. I stated that we had at a previous meeting um, approved the sick time and would be covered until the meeting that we had held. I recommended that the donated sick times be approved and that the EAW work with human resources depend on to work on how to disperse those sick days. On a roll call of three to zero, that item was approved and filed. Next, we took up ROS 1-10, which was to update the superintendent's goals and to consider changing the evaluation cycle. Um, the night previous to this meeting, we had had a, um, a training with full school committee, um, and Dr. Monner has provided an update on her entry plan and stated that it would be finalizing and that she would be getting us some data back um, on our December 15th school committee meeting and seeking feedback. On a roll call of three to zero, that item was filed. The next item was GB2-24, which was brought to the committee by Ms. Novick, which was to consider what observances are recognized by the Worcester Public Schools. Dr. Moore stated that the district will be reviewing the calendar to ensure that all observances are considered and accommodations are made. And I made the following motion to hold the item for updates from district as we work on part of the strategic plan. On a roll call of three to zero, that motion was approved. The next item was GB2-25, which was to make provisions within all secondary schools for, for space for prayer during the day for those whose religious observances require it repeatedly and add it to the student handbook. Dr. Moore stated that the district will ensure that all students and families are, are fully informed of the availability of prayer space and that the information will be inserted into the 2023-2024 student handbook. On a roll call of three to zero, that item was filed. The next item was GB2-140, which is an item that I brought, which was to re request the administration provide an update within the next couple of weeks. This item was actually from April. Um, Dr. Moore stated that the district will be adding additional mental health supports to the schools. The administration will be assessing the needs of the high school and middle schools first. Member Johnson did state that the previous caseload numbers were actually based on last year and that he made the following motion, which was to request the administration to run an update on caseload numbers and the number of mental health providers. I made the following motion to request the administration to seek a legal opinion on the feasibility of allowing personal outside counselors to come in to work with students. I know that we're working with some community agencies, but if a student has an outside clinician that they're working with, if we could let that particular person come into the school to meet with the students. On a roll call of three to zero, the motions were approved and that item was held. The next item was CMP 2-11, which was, nope, Ooh, I'm faster than I thought. <laughs> GB 2-147, which was to review district policy A, C, and B, which was to ensure alignment of the United States Department of Education, August 2021, letters to students, educators, and other stakeholders regarding victims' rights laws in the United States of Department of Education on July 2021. Um, we had done some work on this last spring, and it, there was an update done to our policy and our handbook, and on a roll call, that item was filed. The next item was GB 2-176, which was to request the administration to review and update the attendance policy if necessary. Um, the 
administration is still working on this item. So on a roll call of three to zero, that item was held for further updates and possibly will be taken up at the next meeting. And then on a roll call of three to zero, the meeting ended at 5.43 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Novick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Member Mailman, but I, I believe that the, the question regarding, we've, we've now been told twice um, that we have a quarry policy. Um, and, and if in fact it's a policy, then it should have been adopted by the Worcester by the Worcester School Committee. I have never seen such a document, so I don't think we probably have a quarry policy. We may have a quarry procedure. Um, it, I would be interested in seeing it. I, I don't want to. I'm happy to have the item filed or whatever else. But I believe that the that the reason the question is being asked is because we have parents who, in some cases, are being prevented from volunteering. Um, due to things that are well back in their history, which may actually have absolutely zero implications on their ability to actually, uh, uh, you know, effectively um, and safely operate as volunteers in the in the public school system, um, and so I, I that that I would I would like to have us evaluate the, the there is there yes there are regulations but we also do have per, flexible parameters there is some ability of us to make decisions as a district. Um, and I'm not sure that the discretion is being exercised in a way that's um, effective in terms of um, authentically partnering with our families in a way that continues to also still keep the district safe. So if it's possible for us to see what the language is, and at least, um, and just I, I would direct that question to the administration because I, I'm not satisfied that we're doing a, a good job on that. Okay. You want to... I don't no, think no. I believe Ms. Boulay is not actually there. So if I, I can, unless Remember someone Clancy. has has a response, that's fine. Member Clancy. Thank you. So through the chair of Member Novick, I did find a policy on um, in the in our larger Worcester Public School policy, and it is barely clear that student that if um, volunteers such as PTO members who are not going to be in direct contact with students. Do not have to be quarried. Right. No, and I appreciate that. I mean that when we talk about a quarry check, we're talking about effectively as like a criminal background check, and right. and that's where, and and yes, there's a there's a but there there that we have we require them, for example, for someone who wants to go on a field trip or that kind of thing. Um, and and I'm certainly not disputing that that and yes, our policy does say that, and there are, we're following regulation and law, but what constitutes a cleared quarry versus what constitutes you failed your quarry. It, we say it as if it's a standard thing and it isn't actually a standard thing. There's a, we do actually have a bit of flexibility within our decision-making process as a district. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Through the chair, member um, O'Connell Novick, we actually have asked our um, our attorney to take a look at our existing policy when it comes to Corey around those exact um, pieces. We've had some parents ask us about, you know, situations that may be so long ago and, and it's still impacting their ability to engage with um, their school. So we want to, we've asked her to take a look at it. Let us know, um, do we just have some really antiquated practices that we might be able to look at differently? When we get that back, we will then bring that forward um, for the committee to, um, to, to determine next steps. Excellent. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. So we have a motion to approve. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Okay. Input from the uh, student advisory. Uh, Kendra, are we all set? You got Okay. Kendra? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Kendra Neem, um, ex officio. Um, I'm from Worcester Technical High School, and I'd first like to highlight a pretty positive thing we had um, some time back. Um, I believe it was last month. Um, the student representatives were offered an opportunity to go to a conference, um, a delegate assembly, excuse me, um, held by Masser. 
So if you're not familiar with MASTERD, it's um, the acronym for Massachusetts Association of Student Representatives. So I just wanted to commend student reps who were able to make it to the delegate assembly. I believe it was two, not including myself, it was two other student representatives that were able to make it out there. At the delegate assembly, we were able to connect, we were able to network, and most importantly, we were able to breed these leaders, future leaders and current leaders for Worcester Public Schools to bring back home. Um, at the master delegate assembly, um, I would also say a personal win is I was elected to the master e-board um, as secretary. Um, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, we met some pretty great people out there. I'm really excited to be part of the team and bring back opportunities back to the community. That is our goal. Um, following that, um, I also have some transportation updates. I should say feedback from students. So the new buses are great. Um, I personally take the bus and there were days that I got stranded. I would have to like pay for an uber to get to school but i would like to say that you know the new buses are great i haven't been stranded since so that's a win <laughs> <laughs> um unfortunately though i would say that the buses are still very crowded i ride the bus in the morning and students do not have seats there are times where there are like four kids in a seat People are trying to sit on people's laps. People are on the floor in the emergency exit aisle standing. It's it's really bad. It's a safety concern I would like to bring up. Um, also, I, the main issue that at least I've gotten from students across all the high schools was the transportation issue was mainly coming from, you know, being picked up in the morning. I mean, like students didn't know where their bus were um, and we were supposed to have access to the app that was going to tell us where our bus was. Um, I've surveyed a couple students. I'm sorry, I don't have that data with me now, but I surveyed students across the district, specifically high school students. And um, I unfortunately didn't get one student that told me they were familiar with the app or even knew about the app. Um, me personally, I never received information about the app as well. So I, I wanted to bring that up as well. Um, at my school personally, at Worcester Tech, um, I haven't gone to other schools about this, but I, I could speak on behalf of Worcester Tech. There are still students that do not get picked up from school on time. Um, there are kids that literally get home at like four o'clock and we get out at 143. And it's very conflicting for students that have other commitments outside of school. Some people have like younger siblings, they have to babysit. Me personally, I have a job and um, there have been times that I have gone out and my bus is not outside. And I, again, have to pay for an Uber to go home. Um, thirdly, Sorry. I'd like to revisit the issue regarding bathrooms. Um, I believe this was brought up several times last year um, and student reps urged for you guys to send out notices that were sent out that have been brought to my attention to prohibit faculty, or let me say moreover schools, locking student restrooms, um, it's still happening. Restrooms are still being locked. Um, I spoke to member Stacia about it. Yeah, she, she told me that, you know, last year there were several times that it was brought up that students had to walk to other sides of the building to have access to a restroom. And I just wanted to also bring up out there that it still happens. And I also lastly wanted to bring up that men menstrual, menstrual, excuse me, products should be accessible to all people in all restrooms. They're expensive and it's a necessity. And I just personally think it's unacceptable that bathrooms are being locked and it's it's just a human right to use the restroom thank you
Thank you for your input. Much appreciated. Okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, Member Novick. Yes. Can I just, I just wanted to note that, that several of the um, comments that um, our ex officio member made, which I very much appreci appreciate, as you said, um, were, are, are actually currently financed operations. So um, it isn't that the a directive has gone out to the, the bathrooms. We actually asked on the bathrooms, we did ask administration to um, come back with a plan as to make it happen because we understand there might be staffing issues. Uh, menstrual products is still an F and O. Um, and transportation, we have monthly meetings on. We actually just had an update on that yesterday. So um, I, I would urge that if you are seeing that level of, um, of uh, people on a bus, there is actually periodic reports that go to transportation, but do let somebody know what your bus number is because that shouldn't be happening. But um, remember our student reps are always welcome at the subcommittee meetings too. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we are on 2-8, 2-289. To set up a targeted assistance grant in the amount of three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Approval on the roll call. Member roll call. Clancy, yes. Vice Chair Johnson, yes. Member Kamara, yes. Member Mailman, yes. Member McCullough, yes. Member O'Connell Novick, yes. And Mayor Petty, <laughs> yes. To accept the career technical education equitable access grant in the amount of one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, to approve the fiscal prior fiscal year payments for roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes. Uh, we are on that 2 18 point sixteen response to the administration request to update the community on the list of public schools and COVID. Madam Superintendent. Thank you through the chair. Committee, I do not think you got a copy of this this evening, did you? The the numbers, it's not on it's not in front of you. My apologies. You'll have it next week. It's just a lot of numbers for you to follow verbally, but I will read them to you. So um, starting with our burn coat quadrant, the number of students that were positive um, since the last time we reported, which was I think three weeks ago, 32 students in the burn coat quadrant, 19 staff members, student attendance is 90.69%, staff attendance is 89.92%. In the Doherty um, quadrant, we have 33 students, uh, 17 staff members positive. Student attendance is 92.86%. St staff attendance is 88.88%. In the North quadrant, 27 students, 24 staff, 91.55% student attendance, 90.20 um, staff attendance. South quadrant, 25 students, 19 staff members, 92.24% student attendance. Staff attendance is 90.13. District-wide, the number of students um, since the last time reported is 117. That is 44 more students than last reported. Keep in mind, we did have more uh, school days since the last time we reported. Staff is actually 92 staff in total, which is 31 less than last reported. So kind of flipped than what we were before. So I wanna still keep um, bringing this back to you so we can monitor it, especially as we're moving into this flu season. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the motion is to Okay, updates for the next meeting. Okay. Request that the administration explore offering drivers ed utilizing local driving schools at high school at the high school level. Uh, member McCullough. As it reads. Uh, roll call. We'll refer that to the committee on teaching, learning, and student supports. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Fed. Yes. The four letter from the school committee to the MIAA asked them to take into consideration the challenges that districts across the state are facing with scheduling and transportation for playoff games in regards to the new playoff structure 
where many teams are traveling great distances. Uh, Member McCullough. Thank you. Certainly, I think we've all heard some of the challenges that we've faced as our district this year with the new MIA structure for playoffs and scenarios where students are traveling greater distance and the times of certain games have to be earlier to accommodate multiple games going on at one school, depending on how the MIA has structured and assigned and tiered. Um, you know, we've had a few instances this year where because of transportation shortage, which is going on everywhere, that we had students leaving school at 10 o'clock in the morning for a four o'clock game so that they would be able to be provided with transportation. Um, it's just such a challenge that not only our student athletes are facing and our coaches are facing, but ADs across the state are really, I mean, it's like playing some type of Tetris or Jenga to try to get these solutions figured out, get the game scheduled. Um, you know, in a, a district like Worcester, we had many teams going to playoffs this year from field hockey to football to soccer and just trying to logistically deal with that. And, you know, it's the districts are all left holding the bag on that when the MIAA is setting up the entire schedule. And it's just really creating a challenge additionally for districts like ours who have the transportation shortage. And we've heard from other districts across the state where this is an issue. I think, you know, further on top of that, it really is unfair to student athletes and families when these games are at such a great distance at inconvenient times as well, because you're not getting fan bases there either. So it's already a challenge for these students to be traveling the greater distance, but they're also not having that benefit of having the school support in many cases. I mean, the ultimate goal of this is the challenges that we're facing with scheduling and transportation, but I really think it's a big concern looking at this. Um, you know, it's not just, you know, home field advantage. You're talking about a very big difference when you're not even going to be able to get fans at a game for our students who really deserve to have that opportunity. So I would request that we do forward a letter to the MIAA, um, you know, looking at this issue that most districts across the state are facing and see what we can do. Okay. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. So the recommendation is to forward a letter. Uh, roll call. Member Clancy. Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Kalanovic? Yes. And Mem Mayor Petty? Uh, yes. Next is a review of current policy regarding service and support animals in school and make any necessary changes. Member Clancy? Um, actually, as it reads. Okay. Thank Motion is referred to Stan Community and Government's employee issues. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell-Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes, we're going to announce them. So tomorrow is Veterans Day. Tomorrow, 8.30, Veterans Inc. will have their pancake breakfast. And I think the parade goes off around 10.30, 11. Then they'll have a ceremony in front of their, in front of Veterans Inc. around 11.30. And 12 o'clock is Vietnam Memorial and the Leaf, the Wreath Laying. And at one o'clock is the uh, Korean War Memorial wreath laying, if people are interested. Okay. With that, we have a motion to adjourn. Roll call. Member Clancy? Yes. Vice Chair Johnson? Yes. Member Kamara? Yes. Member Mailman? Yes. Member McCullough? Yes. Member O'Connell Novick? Yes. And Mayor Petty? Yes.